Hi, I'm Andy uh, Nairn. I'm one of the founders of uh, the creative agency Lucky Generals. We're about nine years old. We've got um, offices in London and New York, and we work with clients like Amazon and Virgin Atlantic and Yorkshire Tea and The Co-op. Thanks so much. Andy, welcome. Such an honour to have you on the podcast. Uh, you're a creative tour de force uh, and a, an amazing, amazing uh, head co-founder of an amazing agency. Um, and yeah, just also incredible author now. Uh, so congratulations on that. And I'm guessing a fan of baked beans um, uh, with a picture you. in your background. Yeah, uh, do you know what? That's by a very talented um, friend of mine who's a great food pho photographer called Patrice de Villiers. So she, uh, I think, I, I, think I, I nicked that off her at some point, but she can make any food, including baked beans, look beautiful. So Marvellous. Yeah, is, is, is Heinz a potential future client then? Uh, do you know, maybe this is like a sort of Darren Brown sort of uh, exercise. I'm trying to influence <laughs> if the Heinz uh, marketers <laughs> are, are, are watching. I'd love to yeah, get them to give me a call. <laughs> okay, marvellous. Anyone from Heinz? Yeah. <laughs> let, let, let me know. We'll give you Andy's details after the call. But um, the reason why we wanted to, to hop on this podcast is um, you recently wrote a, an incredible book you launched earlier in the year called Go Luck Yourself. And the book um, is brilliant. So congratulations. <laughs> it shares, it shares uh, 40 sort of tips, how you can, 40 tips on how you can kind of get more luck into your own life. And I think if, any, if anyone's listening, it's what's lovely about it, I, I thought, is it's so easy to read. So if anyone's scared of reading big books, don't be scared of this one. It's like the little 40 snippets are each kind of like five, 10 minutes long. So it's just, it was so easy to, to read in little chunk size amounts. And they're, they're all loads of marvelous stories. So Thank yeah, you. congrats. But what made you come up with a book and sort of why now what, what, what was the influence behind it do you know what? it was probably one of these um ridiculous things that some of us did in you know lockdown right at the beginning of the lockdown I, I had this foolish idea that I was going to have too much time on my hands can you imagine that because obviously we all turned out to be working like harder than ever and it was all quite busy and hectic wasn't it but I I sort of at the beginning of lockdown thought I'm going to have loads of time sitting around which doesn't really you know sit well with me usually so I like to be busy and so I had this idea for a book uh, and I sort of had this idea about writing about luck because I feel like I've been really lucky over the years and then using the book to bring some luck to some other people and um, because obviously I was very conscious especially at the beginning of lockdown that a lot of young people a lot of um, uh, people with less money you know working class talent were having a really tough of time of it so I, I wrote a book about luck where all the royalties go to help an organisation called Commercial Break, uh, who help working class talent get into the industry. So that's that's why I wrote it and uh, and when I wrote it. That's amazing, and it, it's it's um it's so lovely. Also, the the royalty thing. Um, when I was reading it, you 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 also the way that you promoted and everything has been done in quite a fun way. You said that you left copies of books in in different places all over the world. <laughs> Um, and you, you even said that you left them in, in lucky places. Well, I mean, hopefully those copies have been picked up by now or they'll be very damp. Um, yeah. what, what were some of the lucky places you chose? But, you know, this is a big part of it. Because I, I figured that, you know, a lot of business books are really boring, aren't they? Including books yeah. about creativity and marketing. Right. I mean, they market themselves terribly. And I kind of think, well, that that's a great irony then. We should, you should practice what you preach. So if this book is supposed to be about creative thinking, let's market it really creatively so we yeah we did all sorts of fun things like leaving it in places like the black cat cafe in london <laughs> or the horseshoe bar in glasgow um <laughs> we sent a few copies to people with the surname uh, of luck uh in various parts of the world and who work in marketing yeah. you know, there's a, about three or four of them so we gave each one of them a book um we I put ten pound notes in a couple of copies in Waterstones, and then filmed myself, um, you know, uh, putting the money in and putting it back on the on the bookshelf. And of course, all that stuff is what we tell our clients to do, which is like it just creates, you know, it costs you a tenner, yeah. but it get, it, that got loads of traction on social media. And actually, one of the nicest yeah. things that just happened the other week was um, that the book won a gold uh, award at the Creative Circle Awards. Um, you know, for creativity. And, and I, I don't imagine there's many books that have done that yeah. before. 
and I, but that's what I wanted to set out to do. The book itself, if it is about creativity, should be creative in the way that we market it. That should be creative. So we did we did loads of really funny, stupid, silly stuff because although the you know the subject is serious to some degree, you know I think we should also have a bit of fun in our mm. lives as well. Yeah, and there was I was trying to catch because um, you said that you've made a you've inserted a mistake into the book. Yes. Um, has has the person won the? Mistake yeah, well, yeah. you know, that turned out to be the bane of my life, really. Uh, so I, I basically, the idea was, I, I like the idea that you can learn from your mistakes and that sometimes right. mistakes are going to be lucky. So I did a deliberate mistake in the book. And then in the last chapter of the book, I, I tell you, you know, that what I've done, I've put a mistake in here. If you if you can find it, um, I'll give you a couple of hundred quid um, reward. Um, and that the amount tied in with one of the other stories in the book. So it was all kind of neatly right. wrap, wrap, wrapped up. I thought that's quite clever. Um, unfortunately, of course, what happened then is that people start besieging me with suggestions <laughs> of, of the mistake, some of which are, are not deliberate mistakes, like they're picking right. up my grammar, they're pointing out <laughs> other things that I've done not intentionally, you know, and, and it was it was actually sort of uh, terrible for a couple of months because people were just... Um, picking faults <laughs> with the book, and I say no, that's not it. Thanks for the uh, <laughs> thanks for the advice. Um, and eventually, um, uh, long story short, the the mistake was I just it was quite an obscure one. I sort of um, used uh, one um, uh, the, the wrong Roosevelt, you know, president in America. I, I referred to one. Uh, I think I referred to Ted Roosevelt when it was actually um, F.D. Roosevelt in one of the things. So it was, right. quite, it was quite hard to find. And no one actually got that, but somebody did spot an even more obscure mistake, which was not deliberate, but I kind of thought, well, it's it's such a good factual error that it, it was to do with a, um, I'm going to get this the wrong way around. I think the Greek, he was either Greek or Roman, and that was my mistake. I still can't remember. Um, poet called Ovid. And somebody right. had this, 2000 year old you know man, man should spot that after 2000 years so i thought you can get the 100 quid for that mate uh i've still got regular suggestions now of what of all the mistakes might be in the book so your second printing is going to be the world's most perfect book yeah <laughs> sort of absolutely. any grammatical errors will be it because i'd imagine there's a lot of copywriters who probably buy the book as well yeah it's, yeah true. it's um and you 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 started off um Actually, you're you're a strategist, if I I'm, yeah. if I remember rightly. So from the thank God I got that right. So I was reading the book, and uh, you you there was this brilliant suggestion. I think it's near the end of the book. You talked about um, how you can often find insights, or you can often get creative ideas from from anywhere, and and. Uh, I think a lot of people always have creative blocks, and you shared this marvelous story, and I think it was. Is it David Bowie, um, oh, and, yeah. and he he and song lyrics, or was it McCartney and song lyrics, or something? Of course, I've been quite a lot of. I'm interested in lots of ways that musicians come up with song lyrics. So David Bowie yeah. used to um, get a newspaper and cut it up into little bits, and then throw the bits in the air and just see what the patterns were that were created in. And that might inspire, you know, just interesting ideas and juxtapositions like, you know, diamonds and dogs. The word diamond <laughs> and dogs, you might think of diamond dogs. And that word doesn't, you know, that expression doesn't exist, diamond dogs. But it sounds like quite a cool thing. That was one of his albums, I think, that he got from just yeah. words up to get diamond dogs. <laughs> um, or um, Tom Waits, the blues musician, he puts two radios on at the same time um, with different stations and then looks for unusual clashes and collisions between you know, different genres or melodies or lyrics um, that sort of create something interesting new. Because that, that's sort of all that creativity is really, isn't it? Like taking different yeah. things from elsewhere and bumping them together and create something new. Um, so, yeah, I, I like, you know, I encourage people to deliberately get lots of different things in their lives and smash them together, you know, um, to create something new. You can either wait for that to happen by accident or like Bowie and Waits, you can sort of almost do it deliberately. Yeah, it must I think it must have been one of the Beatles. Is the story maybe? Oh, I think you did mention those ones in the book. There was also one I think with the Beatles where they look at the the lyrics. Or you you were saying that you are, or you looked at the lyrics and you were it trying was, to think of like I, positioning I strategy. Yeah, it was Paul McCartney. So he um, he dreamt the tune to um, Yesterday. 
and um, he, he woke up with this amazing tune and he was worried that he was going to forget the tune if he didn't have some lyrics. So he was desperately looking around for something to write um, the song about and there was nothing there. He was on a tour bus, I think. And the only thing he saw was Sunday having breakfast. So he started writing these terrible lyrics. I mean, they're the worst lyrics of all time. And he was like, um, um, scrambled eggs. Oh, my baby, how I love your legs but not as much <laughs> scrambled eggs you know, really really terrible desperate lyrics and um, but he, he kept the, that that kept the tune in his head and and yeah. that remained the song for about six months i think it was he would sing this uh, scrambled egg song until i think john lennon told him if you don't um if you don't stop playing that fucking scrambled egg <laughs> song where that, that's us no more sort of thing so um he so then he went back to writing sort of proper lyrics, but I thought that was a good lesson in you know sometimes you just need to collide things like in that in this case a great tune and and some rubbish about eggs, smash them together and see where it takes you um, to get yourself started. You can always go back afterwards and edit and get to a better place, and and I, so I often use that as a sort of a cure for writer's block if I'm lost for something you know can't think of a strategy or a creative thought or whatever an idea for an article, just write about anything and then you can work it all out afterwards. So in the book, I sort of take the lyrics to yesterday and then imagine coming up with lots of different strategies to a brand um, just using the um, the lyrics to yesterday. But you can do it with anything, really. It, it was amazing when I was listening to it. And um, I mean, how long, just out of interest, how long did it take you just for that little bit when you were thinking of strategic insights for writing that bit? Was that quite quick for you or did was that... Something that would take a while. Because uh, you know, the point of the exercise is not to really demand huge amounts of quality. It's about quantity right. and, and speed right. you know, and, and what you can do. And I, I tried to make a point of, I think yesterday was two and a half minutes long. So in two and a half minutes, you, you can probably come up with 20 different strategies. You know, a lot of them might be rubbish, but um, there'll be a couple of good ones in there. Um, you know, yet, the first line of yesterday is... You know, yesterday's so that's um, heritage, isn't it? So there's a heritage strategy. You're off to the races already. You've got one in the very first word. You know, all my troubles seem so far away. Well, that's all about problem solution. Maybe there's like an irrational thing. Now it looks it looks if they're here to stay. Well, maybe where's here? That's like a provenance strategy. So you know, very quickly you can get into the groove of generating loads of different thoughts. And then just like Paul McCartney with the eggs, you can go back afterwards and say, well, that's not making sense. That's rubbish. <laughs> but you'll still you you at least you're working from twenty crap ideas then rather than a blank sheet of paper so right no it's it's incredible i if, it, if anyone uh, hasn't bought the book yet you need to buy it immediately even if just for that alone plus obviously you'll feel marvelous because you're going to be helping uh, more disadvantaged people get into the creative industry which is which mm -hmm. is lovely is, is that a the charity that you're supporting is that something that that you started or is that something something yep. that you found it's just some, it's a group of people that we had worked with successfully before. I really like right. them. I like the people that run it. They've got very good, um, I just think they've got a really good hold on the issue. I mean, they've been doing it for a long time and they, they're they trying to do it for real rather than a kind of a pretendy sort of performative way. Like, you know, they're not, you know there's a lot of, um, I guess if I'm being cynical, there's a lot of organisations on at the moment that kind of make it look as if they're doing something good, but maybe it's right. not really actually making much of a difference but um what i liked about them is they were very honest so for instance one of the things that they um started doing was rather than helping young working class talent get into the industry they sort of put that on hold for a bit because what they found was that they were getting people in and then they were um getting booted out the other end too quickly you know because they weren't fitting in you know, so it's, right. what diversity is one thing but um if people come in and then don't feel included, then it's a bit pointless. All you're doing is like a revolving door sort of thing. So they, so they put a halt on that, which I thought was admirable, you know, because I guess the, you know, um, that that takes a little bit of honesty to sort of say, well, that's not working. And then really, what they focused on more was then how do you, how do you make people feel included, um, so that you're ready to accept new recruits if you if you see what I mean. So yeah. and they're just like a really good and. Um, I would recommend anyone who's kind of interested in trying to up their game in that field to give them a shout. That's commercial break. Commercial that? break. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Must, uh, I'll get in touch with you after. So I wonder whether there's something we can do with them as well. Yeah. At least to try and help. Um, and then you, 
I've got so many notes here. I don't know where mm. to start. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess like what what were some of the so the look. What was some of the? Um, I mean, I, I remember there was another story that you told in the book that I I really enjoyed, which was Jeff Bezos. It looks like you do Amazon work for uh, for the agency as well, which is amazing. Congratulations! Um, did you get to meet Jeff, and and is that how you found out about these lucky boots that he has? <laughs> uh, I've never met Jeff. The rest of my other team have. I don't really. Um, I can't claim fame to personally work <laughs> on Amazon. I, I did in the early years, but um, I've not worked on it for a while. But um, he's been very involved in, you know, until recently, obviously he's left now, but and until recently he was, you know, really quite involved, certainly in the, um, in, in the, the bigger campaigns like the Super Bowl campaign. And in fact, our first campaign of the Super Bowl featured him in the ad, which is quite a big risk really when you think about it. I mean, it's a big <laughs> risk there for them to give the Super Bowl brief to some small agency in London, um, and then it was probably a big risk for us to suggest putting the boss in the campaign and then to slightly take the piss out of the company as well. But they were great. The client were brilliant um, because they appreciated that, you know, really, especially on the Super Bowl, when people want to be entertained, um, you don't want to come across as all boastful and corporate and say how wonderful you know, the, the Alexa product is, even though it is, but, you know, nobody wants to hear that. You, they'd probably rather see you um, be a bit more self-deprecating and take the piss out of yourselves and how ubiquitous you are and maybe even take the piss out of um, the boss. Um, so that's what we did. We had, we had this great um, story where we imagined what would happen if Alexa lost her voice. Um, and of course, Jeff Bezos is walking around saying, "Hey, how is this even possible?" Um, and and um, his aides all assuring them that they were on it, but you know that they were going to s- s- make it work. But um, you could tell that they were really worried that they weren't going to be able to make it work. And we, we had all these celebrities filling in for it. anyway. The the point was, it was kind of a it was a very interesting use of uh, of of the most expensive advertising real estate in the world. You know that that's fifteen million dollars a spot. Just, just for the media time sort of thing, um, and to spend it on effectively showing your product not working and taking the piss out of the company is pretty, um, uh, you know, brave, I guess, um, in in commercial terms for them. But it worked brilliantly. It was the American public voted it the best and their favourite um, Super Bowl ad um, out of all of them that year, which is the first time, it was the only time that a British company has ever um, achieved that honour. And since then, we've had a couple of second places and a third place. So that formula of just you know, being self-deprecating and acknowledging your flaws is actually often quite a really good way to sort of make people like you more than if you just say how brilliant you are. And I think that seems to be becoming more true today than it perhaps was in the past as well. I think it sort of also often helps so that you're a bit more genuine. Um, yeah. In a, in a way, because you know, none of us are perfect. Out of interest, how on earth did you get the Amazon account? Like, how does that happen? How does a, a London agency get a sort of a Super Bowl ad for an Amazon thing? Is that is that just a normal That's pitch a lot, thing, or did you phone a, them up and? Like, it was yeah. after a year, and we, um, you know, it was quite. It was very interesting this because. We were only about a year old, so we were quite tiny. It was quite ridiculous. And, and actually, Amazon weren't at that stage. I mean, they're now probably, if not the biggest advertiser in the world, in, in the top couple. Um, yeah. But back then, they didn't really spend any money on advertising and necessarily, um, you know, uh, believe in it because, of course, the company had been so successful without it. Um, so anyway, we got a call, and we couldn't believe it. Wow, Amazon, you know, because um, even back then, they were pretty huge, were coming in to see us. And we were a bit worried that we were um, too small. Um, because at that stage we were only about 15 you know, people or something like that. And so yeah. we, we we started going around the rest of our office block asking people, could you sit in our office just for a little while just to make us look a bit bigger <laughs> and fill the place up a bit because we've got all these empty desks. And I always remember we got some people from, uh, I think, a double glazing or window cleaning. That was a window cleaning. <laughs> and could you just sit there? We'll pay you you know, a, a little bit of money just to sit around for a, a couple of you know, thought, great. Um, and they had all these um, jumpers on, you know, like fleeces saying, you know, 
ZXY Windows <laughs> services, stuff like that. But, but around our way, we kind of thought that's probably just like urban chic, you know, it probably just yeah. looks like you're being cool, you know, like a thousand pounds, these jumpers. So, so all these blokes sitting around who are window cleaners. And then when, but when we got into the, um, the, the meeting and we were thinking, all right, great, we feel a bit big. They, they were sort of a bit disappointed about, you know, I thought we'd, I thought you'd be smaller. And, and, and they meant what they said was, um, we were really looking, we're really looking for a small, team because we've also we're huge we don't need numbers we, we'd rather work with small groups of tightly committed people and they have this rule called the pizza rule the two pizza rule that the jeff bezos thing if you I know it. um yeah so you need to build <laughs> a huge team on two pizzas and if the, the team can't be fed on two pizzas then um you, know, you have to split the team up and get a smaller team so so we probably shot ourselves in the foot so um <laughs> uh, we managed to get it anyway despite our so that just shows you should never try and cheat like that um, and we did tell them about it afterwards, and they thought it was quite funny that we'd been trying to be all big, but really what they wanted was small. So we got there. That in the is end. hilarious. It was, I mean, because you, you started the agency in was it 2013, 2014? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, so it's really not that old when it, when you come to think of it. You're coming up to your tenth anniversary. It's yeah. Exciting. Yeah, that's great. Right? And yeah. h- how did you come up with the, the names? So you, there's uh, three three of you, right? Who started yeah. this? There's three of us. Um, do you know what? That was pretty lucky as well, like a lot of these things. And, and again, so until about three days before launch, we had a completely different name. I won't go into it because it's, it's a long story, but it, we, we had registered the um, a, a completely different name. I still get things from HMRC, you know, in connection <laughs> with this previous coming. It's a pain in the neck, actually. Um, but um, uh, something happened, like a news story that then – without being too cryptic, made that name um, inappropriate. I mean, actually, maybe I should say it. So then right. the name was House on Fire. That's what we were going to call ourselves. Right. Um, and the, the logic being, we, the three of us, we've worked together for years, me, Helen, and Danny. We got on like a house on fire. We want to work with brands, you know, people that we get on with like a house on fire um, and hire people. You know, we, we just like having a good time. We think having fun in your working life is important, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So we're perfect. That's great. House on Fire. And then there was a terrible house fire, which, you know, a number of children died in. And, and then we started thinking, yeah, that this is going to happen often enough for this to be a horrible thing yeah. to, to be, you know, to be associated with. Every time you Google us, you're going to be met with these horrible images. So um, so we parked that. But then we had a real panic for, you know, we had two days to launch and we didn't have a name now. <laughs> and and it, it was an old school band from Danny uh, who he'd always uh, wanted to call a band uh, when he was a teenager, um, Lucky Generals, and I think his p- bandmates chose something else. So this is his <laughs> chance to sort of call the band uh, Lucky Generals, and he did, and we, we've we never looked back. It's been one of the luckiest things happened to us, really. The name's been great for us. Oh, that's amazing. And what, what was the lucky coincidence that brought the three of you together? Uh, well, I had worked with Helen for a long, long time. I mean... I first worked with her like almost 30 years ago and, and really for the last right. 20 years I've worked with her nonstop. So, um, and then Danny, we, we met, um, 15 years ago. So all three of us, we just got on really well, like, you know, like a house on fire. And <laughs> I feel like that is lucky in, you know, a lot of people want to start up agencies, but don't meet the right people or, or the planets don't all align at the same time. You know, I've right. met, I've spoken to loads of people who'd be a brilliant, amazing sort of founders of agencies, but the things just haven't worked out because you need to, all three want to do it or four or whatever it is. You need yeah. to um, all want to have to do it at the same time. You know, everything's going to match up with your families and you know, all that kind of sort of stuff, lifestyles, life stages, children. And for us, it all just, everything just fell into place. And we really, I, th- I think you get these chances to, when you get those chances, you should go for them. Um, and we figured out that if it's a disaster, it'll, you know, we'll, we'll still get a job, you know, somewhere. You know, we're not going to be utterly <laughs> unemployable, so fuck it. We might as well just <laughs> a shot and uh, go for it. What were the different skill sets? So you you, you bought the strategy sort of yes. side to things. So I'm and... strategy. Helen is account handling, I guess you'd call it, and Danny right. is a creative. Although I think, you know, we're, we're all very sort of, um, you know, I think we, we overlap quite a lot as well. Um, oh, that's amazing. Oh, bravo. Um, yeah, and you're, I mean, the, you mentioned lots of work in the book as well. And I know, yeah, the, the, there's a fantastic story about Yorkshire Tea and 
and doing things proper. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> those ads are so, so good. Um, I don't know whether you want to share something around that, but they, just before you do, the other thing which I thought was fantastic um, was you recently launched a new uh, Virgin ad. Was that correct? Mm -hmm. um, so Virgin Atlantic, big airline, uh, and they've they've had these wonderful uniforms for a long time. And mm -hmm. I know recently um, they've been sort of trying to promote that they're more inclusive and uh, also quite edgy, I think, in in a way. Like uh, when you watch watch their ads, they're always quite fun and, and going against the stereotypes and the traditional social norms. Um, but yeah, the, the new ad that you've launched for them is incredible as well. So bravo. I'll, I'll link to some of these ads afterwards. But yeah, I wonder whether you wanted to share, because it's in the book in particular, like the, yeah. the bit of that Yorkshire tea thing is it's absolutely fascinating. So Yorkshire tea... Again, I can't claim any personal glory, but we have, you know, I suppose one of the things you do when you've got an agency is you set up an amazing team of other people who yeah. uh, work on these things. And what they um, what they found or what we found was when, so we, we sort of won that piece of business without, and the client told us this afterwards, you didn't really necessarily win the pitch, um, but you, you, you gave us an inkling of, you know, you know, you, we, we sort of felt these are the guys to sort of back and to, to work with and they'll get there eventually. So that was great. That was uh, somebody taking a chance on us. Um, and then, so then we were really motivated to get it right, you know, because we really sort of thought we have to repay this chap. Um, and what, what we sort of noticed was that, so they had this idea, which they talked about in the past about doing things proper. I um, mean, you know, it's a Yorkshire sort of phrase, you know, and they, at that stage they were number three in the marketplace. Um, and, and we sort of figured pro the only thing about proper doing things proper is that it can be a bit boring. Like if you get into the details of, Oh, we, all the amazing quality stories of the types of leaves we choose or the plantations we get our teas from or the processes we get, yada, yada, yada. it's a bit, it is a bit boring. I mean, they do all that and it is amazing, but only if you work in the tea yeah. industry, really sort of thing. So we just thought, mm, we like the idea of proper, but how do we make it more interesting for the mass market? And then when we were going up and down to um, Harrogate, where they're based, the team sort of noticed that, you know, it's, it's not just the tea that they do proper. It's like everything. There's just, the, the, they always talk about the receptionists just being super nice and friendly, like really good receptionists and really good the way they answer the phones and really good, um, you know, the, just the way that you're treated up there. Everything about the whole company was just done really properly. And, and they sort of think, figured, well, that's pretty telling because if, if it's a place where everything's done proper, and that's the line in the end, so I chose, we, we made the line where everything's done proper, then if they if they treat the interviews or the, the hold music or the couriers um, or the, the leaving speeches, if, you, if they treat them as brilliantly as that, then just imagine how much effort they'll put into the tea. Um, so that's what we started doing. We started featuring all these mundane tasks, and then to make it more interesting, we got real people, you know, amazing celebrities from Yorkshire, to um, bring those tasks to life. So let's have Patrick Stewart doing the leaving speech was the most recent one, or Sean Bean um, doing the sort of company pep talk, the, the, the HR <laughs> conversation, or Parkinson doing interviews for jobs and so on. So everything just being elevated to the nth degree, being done properly. And it's taken them from, you know, number three in the marketplace to number one. Um, and it's just, they're, they're a dream client. They're the nicest people and, uh, but very serious commercially as well and uh, very ambitious. So, you know, what's not to like? Yeah, I'd, I'd imagine. I love the lateral thinking. Uh, it's also interesting that obviously it, it, it's not, it's not saying, it's not, it's not literally talking about the tea. It's sort of, yeah. it's, it's all the stuff around it, which yeah. then I, I, I love that in advertising when that happens, as opposed to it just being straight, you know, this yeah. Is, so, yeah, we, yeah, I mean, Bravo. And it must be quite risky for them to make that. Yeah. You know, was it hard for you to sell that in? Um, Cause it, it, well, we're not going to talk about your tea at all. We're going to talk about all the things around your tea and that's going to reflect they lovely very, on the tea. They were very supportive and very encouraging. Nice. And also about the whole Yorkshire thing, because it's sort of a, I think some other clients might have felt they wanted to, you know, th their position was that they were number three and a more of a regional player and they wanted to become national. So it's sort of counterintuitive to really dial up the Yorkshire thing with Yorkshire celebrities and doing things proper and all the rest of it. But they, they really understood that 
really we were selling Yorkshire as a sort of a spirit. You know, it's an attitude that even if you're not from Yorkshire, in fact, actually, the, when we launched it, the biggest uplift in sales was from Lancashire. So I thought that was a real um, mark of success that we're getting Lancashire <laughs> people to drink Yorkshire tea. I mean, God, that, that is absolutely mind-blowing sort of thing. So, um <laughs> Yeah, it's that it's you need that partnership between a great client. You know, it's the same with Amazon or or Yorkshire Tea or Virgin. Um, you know, you need to have a bit of a double act, I guess. I think it's a, it's that lovely thing that you, you know, there seems to be a sort of string through the book as well. So sort of saying it's it's often you know success in life is not necessarily how smart and clever you are. It yeah. is about leaving room for all these these wonderful wonderful moments and how you can create more of those wonderful lucky moments yourself i think you yeah. give the example near the start of the book of a was it an exercise that you did on on uh, lucky people versus unlucky people reading a newspaper spotting images it was, an, it, was a, it was a thing done by a uh, professor richard wiseman um right he's like an authority on the psychology of luck so i sort of included a bit in the book um he does this experiment where he splits people up into lucky people and unlucky people. Well, people, you know, people, would you describe yourself as lucky or unlucky? Right. And then he gets them to read a newspaper and the people who say that they're lucky, um, he asks them to, he asks everyone to co count the number of photographs in the newspaper. And the people who say that they're lucky do it in a couple of seconds, literally a couple of seconds. And the people who say that they're unlucky take quite a few minutes. So quite a big difference. And the reason is that he puts a little, um, notice on page two of the newspaper saying uh, hey there's 45 or whatever it is 45 photographs in this newspaper just tell the guy in the door and take your money and go home and <laughs> what he finds is that people who think they're lucky really a lot of the time all that really means is they're good at sort of um spotting opportunities around them that um that are not on the brief you know really but allow them <laughs> to take shortcuts through life you know they, they they can notice opportunity when it's waving at them across the street whereas sometimes people when they say they're unlucky they're sort of people that are all sort of focused and heads down concentrating on the task that they've been given in, in this case to count photographs and he so he teaches individuals to um get better at you know opening their eyes to stuff going on around them in their lives but i think the same applies to organizations because a lot of the time we're so focused on our own sector or the advertising brief that we've been set or the you know the task that we 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 stopped looking out the window and being inspired by nature or sport or you know the outside world or culture and all that amazing stuff that's probably more likely to come up with more interesting ideas and so yeah, I sort of try and encourage organisations to apply the same principle of, you know, trying to unfocus a little bit on the brief and and think about other stuff because 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 real people don't really care about the stuff that's in our briefs. Yeah. They care about other stuff in life. Yeah, it's, it's, it makes so much sense. I mean, what what are some of the things that you know, do you do you have any fame any favourite lucky tips? Uh, I mean, you, you share a lot of them. <laughs> I think one of the one of them is, that, uh, and there's lots of different examples of this in the book. Uh, or one one would be um, to start with what looks like misfortune, turn misfortune into good fortune. You know, a lot of the things when you get a brief are look like bad luck, and so we skip over them because we don't want to depress ourselves. We want to get to the good bit about what is the benefit of this product. Whereas actually, a lot of the time, if you take the worst thing about the brief and really, rather than run away from it, really try and embrace it and and turn it on its head, then that can be really powerful. Like it might be a taboo, you know, people don't want to talk about this category. So rather, but rather than shy away from it, maybe you should run towards it and try and make something big out of it. Um, like I think body form have done that really well with menstruation, but for, for decades, people used to just yeah. shy away from that. It was a bit awkward, but they've literally made a song and dance about it and, you know, done an opera, you know, an ode to Viva La Vulva, you know, it's an amazing sort of a uh, celebration of the taboo. Uh, or it could be, you know, sometimes a small budget can actually be a good thing because it can force you to uh, think more creatively or not having enough time. That can actually be the thing that concentrates your mind or it can be a product flaw. You know, it can be something that looks like a bad thing, um, you know, like Guinness. And it takes a long yeah. time to pour, but actually good things come to those who wait. You know, you can a lot of the time taking the a negative and turning it into a positive is a really powerful way to disarm people a little bit and sort of um and, and get people thinking in a new and interesting light about your brand so that would be a top tip what what was um what's your favorite the, the i mean i think you've done this quite a bit in your own career is is turn, turning turning sort of 
limits into or, or turning uh turning yeah limits into into the the great insight like you have you have you had any personal experience of doing that with the brands that you've worked on sorry i was losing my words there a bit <laughs> the very first thing we worked on was the thing um for paddy power the um, right. irish bookies and they came to us with a brief on homophobia in uh, in football it's a big problem and um big problem they wanted to do something about it, but they didn't have very much money because it was you know it's a charitable exercise for them um and so it was literally on a sh- on a shoestring and 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 so again we so we embraced that and the, we launched with this idea that was has now become rainbow laces, where you know it was the idea of sending rainbow laces out to every single football um, player in the country and then encouraging everyone to put their laces on you know and social media to encourage lacing up, you know nine years later that's a cultural phenomenon it, it's it's happened every year it's now a big part of the football calendar you know the the arch at Wembley's being turned rainbow laces it's. Um, it's it's been a storyline in Coronation Street. Um, I think I think the you know it's just been a sort of a huge part of football and culture that's become much more more accepted. And we're we're working on what the next iteration is for you know for Qatar and for the um, for the tenth anniversary of that next year. But the, the point yeah. is, we if they'd just given us a very conventional, if they'd given us loads of money, we would probably would have come up with something like really boring and like a big um, conventional telly campaign. But Sometimes when you don't have a lot of money, and as I said, literally in this case, it was a shoestring, then embrace that mm. and really force yourself to come up with something more creative. It can turn out to be a blessing in disguise. Yeah, I'd imagine it's, uh, it's amazing. I think your, yeah, so, so much of your work has been so incredible and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what, what comes next. Is, is there anything, anything on the horizon? I mean, uh, I, it, it, there seems to be new things coming out all the time for the agency. So I'd imagine it's growing from strength to strength. Yeah. Thank you. No, there's lot, lots coming up. We love working on people like the co-op, you know, because they're an amazing yep. organization. It's all about, you know, helping the community. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that Virgin stuff. That's been a big sort of hit of this year, this, uh, you know, going back into their DNA, this idea, that, you know, that they see the world differently. And that's the line mm. for, for Virgin Atlantic because, you know, they have always done that since day one. They've been challenging the status quo, but also they allow you to see the world in a different light, you know, through travel. And, and so see the world differently was, was what we launched in, in the spring. But then I think what we always try and do with our work is put actions to the words. You know, we don't just right. put some empty corporate philosophy. So in this case, <laughs> um, we wanted, um, we worked with them to, loosen up the, the rules on uniforms so that people can, you know, just choose whatever their gender is or however they define themselves, they can wear whatever they want. Um, and and that we did a, a fashion runway on the runway um, and did a, a very small scale little uh, social film last week. But it's, it's gone absolutely bananas. You know, it's got enormous numbers on social media because people appreciate that. Oh, that's proof that they really do see the world differently. They're not just talking a good game um, so also fashion really week and yeah. fashion week yeah exactly so it's a it well <laughs> with a whole bunch of other things and it's in it's in culture you know people are obviously talking about this issue and 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 also i think we've done it in a joyful and um you know uh celebratory way rather than a kind of finger wagging and sort of soapboxy sort of lecture mm. about gender differences and all that kind of, sort of stuff it's just been I think it just makes people feel easier about the thing. It's sort of, oh, yeah, okay, people just being themselves, <laughs> doing their own thing. What's not to like about that? There's definitely a power of positivity that seems yeah. to be a theme through all of the work that you do, I think, at the agency. I, I, yeah. I can't remember seeing much finger-wagging. It's, it's all kind of it's generally very not. positive. So yeah. Thank you for helping make the world a brighter, lighter place. Yeah, I think we just found that people are not more, you know, we know I've got... Um, uh, you know, three teenage or sort of uh, thereabouts kids and anyone who's got teenagers will know that, you know, we are not motivated by finger wagging. You know, we, we, <laughs> we delude ourselves if we think that shouting and you know, poking them and telling them to get up out of bed, you know, but if you coax and if you charm and you, you know, you've got to make people feel positive about what you're asking them to do, then you might have a bit more success. It's amazing. Look, um, I know we're running out of time, so I, I always try and end these ones with um, 
with a sort of sharing a, a funny would you rather uh, question. Oh, so, right, okay. um, <laughs> uh, the one which I was going to ask you is, oh, I don't know, I've got, I got two different ones that I was going to ask you, but I don't know which one to do. Um, <laughs> I'll do... Uh, I'll, I mean, I'll share both of them and then you can choose which one to answer if that, if that makes it easier. Um, I was going to ask, uh, would you rather have magnified supervision or magnified super hearing? Or, uh, would you rather be able to talk with all the animals in the world or speak every single foreign language? Oh my God. These are amazing. There's still not the sort of questions I thought were coming my way. <laughs> The magnified super, supervision of super hearing and then animals yeah. or every language. All language, yeah. So you can speak to every human basically on the world. I mean, yeah, it'd be I think, interesting. I think I'm going to say, I'm going to say super hearing, I think. Um, why do I think that? I think, uh, I guess that you could, you could then um, listen to what other people are saying about you. That would be sort of revealing. That's, that's <laughs> great. things that Robbie... Burns thing like would some power the gift to see us to, to see ourselves as other see us type sort of thing. It's the one thing in human life that we never really get to understand. Um, so uh, it might give it might be quite a good use of uh, a sort of self reflection and sort of uh, make yourself keep keep your feet on the ground when you find out all the terrible things that people have got yeah. to say about you. Um, you def definitely need uh, earmuffs when you go to bed though. But then, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and the uh, and the foreign language versus uh, all all animals. Animals. Uh, that's. Um, I'm going to say animals. I think it would just be it'd be amazing to get <laughs> such a different perspective. We've got a cat, and I'm I'm yeah. forever trying to guess what if anything is going through this <laughs> cat's um, head. I suspect not very yeah. much, but. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe there's some amazing thoughts going through there that we're missing out, and I hate that to be the case that we're just treating her as an idiot. But um, yeah, so there's yeah. Socrates just sitting there pondering yeah. life and the meaning of the universe okay. and everything. <laughs> and you know, maybe I, I think as we find out more about animals, you know, they apparently lots of them have got incredible forms of intelligence that we just don't know about yet. So maybe that what are those dolphins chatting about, and yeah, what are the birds saying to each other, and all the rest of it? Be cool. Yeah, I saw, I saw there's a lovely documentary on cats, I think, on uh, on Netflix. Yes, um, what's that? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> it was fascinating that there's so little research on cats versus dogs. I didn't yeah. realise that. I think it's case, because but... cats don't give much, you know, the, the stereotype is that dogs, you know, I suppose dogs don't let you know what they're thinking or what they're feeling or right. superimpose what they're thinking. Whereas yeah. cats just look so inscrutable, don't they? You can't really work out because they don't, <laughs> they've got, I think they've got no facial muscles, so they don't. Yeah. Um, make a, they don't change expressions really. They just look at you right. the same. But that makes them more fascinating. <laughs> That's why I'd love to know what's going on in there. <laughs> and it's been an amazing conversation. Thank you so Thank so you. much for taking the time to chat. And um, I wish you and your agency all the very best. And if anyone wants to go and buy Andy's incredible book, um, I mean Amazon is your client, so probably first place to go is Amazon.com and Absolutely. and search for Go Luck yourself. <laughs> And yes. uh, if you want to learn more about Andy and his agency, it's, um, is it luckygenerals.com? Yeah, that's it. Nice and easy. Fantastic. Um, and uh, we'll put those links in the, in the, in the bio. Thank but you. yeah, thank you so, so much again. Thank um, you very much. It's been an fun. honor. Especially that last little bit. Very funny. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>